hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Mark Wald. I'm with Fantech. Uh, and uh, we can give you an update on Fantech products. Uh, some of this will probably be a review for many of you. Uh, we have a number of great automated products. And uh, uh, there's a couple new things in here. And, and especially since we didn't really have a, an in-person symposium last year, we certainly didn't. Uh, there may be some things that we have, haven't been made aware of. So let's go through those. I know we only have 30 minutes, so I'm going to try to get to this fast. And if there are questions, I'll do my best to answer them. We also have a booth yeah. uh, in the exhibit area so that it, if, if there are additional questions that I don't have time to answer here or can't answer here or you think of later, please come by and see us. We'll give you a piece of candy. Fans are really, um, they're the core of our expertise. Um, our range of fans covers the vast majority of radon mitigation air performance needs that, uh, that you would probably run into, or, or this industry would run into, as well as some similarly mitigated vapor intrusion applications, okay? So not all vapor intrusion, of course, uh, depending on the type of vapor and, and how much suction you use that and all that. But, this um, chart right here gives you a pretty good idea um, where we have, these are our models. If you're not familiar with uh, Fantex model nomenclature, RN1 being our least powerful motor or motorized, you know, uh, radon fan. But the one RN, everybody I would expect to know RN is the periodic symbol for radon on it. Uh, one being um, about what we can do on a suction standpoint. And I didn't put the numerals here because it's about one inch, roughly. Um, this is about two inches of suction, and not exactly, but barely, uh, uh, roughly. So we have different fans that can handle in the green, uh, or gray, whatever that color is, is um, the relative static suction handling capability. So, right, different mitigation applications can require different power Power. Then in the blue or purple or whatever color that looks like to you, uh, the airflow rate that that fan could also produce. Now it's not going to produce both of these coincidentally, but it can do one or the other max. If it's doing this at max, it's doing nothing here and vice versa. But most of the time, your system's going to be somewhere. Uh, but that's our range. Uh, What's that? No, after that explanation is fine, but initially it was a little confusing. Yeah. yeah. Well, I wanted to try to show that, you know, every fan, not just a radon fan, every fan out there has the ability to move air against the resistance, and that's just what they do. Um, so what are the capabilities on either end of that? Sometimes in the radon world, most of the time, we're most concerned about creating a certain suction to get our pressure field extension and yeah. make sure that we prevent as much radon as possible from coming into the building. Um, so the pressure is a lot of times the main thing we're looking at, but not always. Um, sometimes there's air flow we're as concerned about, or maybe that's our primary concern. So every fan has some capability to do one or the other. We find that if we were looking at an actual fan curve, many radon fans, not just fans, but in the industry, they have a very, what you call a steep curve. Um, and that's because suction generally is so important in the radon world. Uh, you know, generally those fans are working on a static suction that is much higher than, say, an HVAC fan. So, um, there you have it. So there's our fan range. A couple things about our fans that are fairly unique. Um, the housing, of course, is a plastic or a resin. It's a molded resin. And that resin, we do put a color control and UV component in there to um, help it keep its white, off-white color as long as possible uh, when it's outside in the sun and things like that. Um, so um, they actually really, really stay as close to their original color as possible for much longer than they did, you know, five years ago. Uh, so we, we improved that fairly recently. Um, the way we actually assemble our fans is uh, the housing. So the housing is two pieces, an inlet and an outlet to the fan, and inside they contain the motor, the impellerized motor. And the way we join those is we call it 
vibration welding. I'm not sure if that's the technical term, but that's what we call around the factory. The, um, the process is really a fusion process, so it is just plastic. And the plastic has a melting point. And what we do is, so this photo here, if you can recognize, that's the contour shape of the radon fan housing. And so we take the inlet and outlet pieces in a machine. They're, they're brought together around the motor, and then the machine, and I'm going to over-exaggerate, the machine vibrates those inlet and outlet pieces across each other real fast, and, and not nearly that far. But, and there's a, a little bit of material right here at that interface, and that material where we're, we're doing this, the friction heats that plastic up just enough to melt it, and then applies just a slight bit of pressure, and then holds it for just a few seconds, actually, and then it's joined. So we don't actually use any caulk or mechanical fasteners at all. That joint it makes this become a single piece now, where it had been two pieces, now it's just one, and it's that one now forever. Um, the only way to open it is to literally break it and to destroy it. Um, the neat thing about it is it's inherently leak-free. Uh, we used to make our radon fans, we would use a bead of caulk, um, silicone caulk or adhesive to hold those two pieces together, and as long as we did a good job using that caulk, it would then be leak-free as well. Uh, this process, there's no human chance for error, so we like it, and it's way faster. We don't have to wait for the caulk to dry or anything else. It's 12 seconds, 15 seconds, something like that, and it's done. Um, anyway, a couple of things. Other than that, nothing super unique or outstanding about what we do. Nice. This model here is um, clearly a different look. Uh, we've had this for years, but just I didn't want to not mention it. It's We call it the slim line, and it's just an appearance only. It's the same pressure class or suction class as the RN2, so we call it the RN2 SL or slim line. It's just designed to try and have a similar appearance to the other utility type stuff that might be on the side of the house, cable box or the, the electricity or the whatever else is on the side of the house. So it's just a for aesthetics. Does that have that same UV protection on it that the other fan does? I don't know if it does. Um, with the gray color, we wouldn't expect the discoloration. Right, okay, yeah. With the white fans, it, yeah. it really, over time, before we start putting that UV um, resistant component into the yeah. resin, they would yellow. Oh, absolutely, see them. Yeah. yeah. So if you find an old Fantech, yeah. or, or one of our competitors with yeah. a white fan, yeah. uh, chances are it's going to be yellow. Much more yellow than it was the day that it was in some way. Yeah, oh yeah. Some people care, some probably care. Some um, in our fans as well, we have two different motor types nowadays. Um, for the first several decades of us making fans and, and, and supplying them to the industry, they all had an AC or alternating current motor in them. Um, now, in the past couple of years, we've added a couple of ECM or electronically commutated motor models to the range. And, and there's a couple of neat things about them, um, and we can go through them here. Um, I wrote myself a script. Um, they, they look the same on the outside. Let's see. ECM fans exhibit the latest technology in fan motors. Known for their energy efficiency, they also lend themselves to speed modulation without the drawbacks associated with speed control of AC motors. Um, so just kind of a, a reminder, and, and we all kind of know this, um, an AC motor converts its electrical energy and mechanical rotation by applying the alternating current to the windings in the stator. Okay, rotor and stator. Stator stays still, the rotor spins. Um, to make that spin happen, there has to be a little bit of slip in an AC motor. Okay, and that little bit of slip is actually also a bit of electrical or, or energy inefficiency. All right, but you have to have some to make it spin. Now, to reduce that spin, you have to actually increase that slip, and one way to do that is to change the power that's being supplied. Like you reduce the the phase, like the, uh, it's like a phase cutting device, like a rheostat or something. And when you do that, you're tricking the motor into spinning slower. Unfortunately, you still waste about you the energy that you wouldn't need to spin the motor. Unfortunately, then still gets wasted a lot of it does in the form of heat, which is bad for motors, and sound, which is bad for uh, radar installation. I mean. You know, uh, you know, I, you want as quiet an uh, installation as you can get across 24 hours a day. 
So we, Fantech, have never recommended that one of our AC motor radon fans be speed controlled for those reasons. Um, however, with these ECM radon fans, we are very comfortable with these being speed controlled. Don't have to, but it's the installer's option. They can't do it. And the reason we're comfortable with that is because when these things run, the electronics that are part of the motor that converts that AC power into a DC power that it supplies to the motor line. And because of DC power, we don't have to rely on uh, slip to make the motor spin. Now, the, uh, uh, the beauty of that is also when we command this motor to go at a lesser speed, the electronics then reduce the, the DC voltage that it delivers to that, those windings. But it does so perfectly or ideally, not perfectly. Ideally, such that there's still no slip, even at reduced speeds. So there's no wasted heat, there's no additional sound, and so we actually see a, a very significant reduction in the energy that the, fan, the motor consumes in the process. So it's energy saving, it runs just as quiet and just as cool as it does an AC motor would run at full speed or this would run at full speed. So we're very comfortable with, with doing that. So it gives the installer some options if they want. Um, here's a couple of examples. Uh, we have two models, by the way. One's uh, the two inch suction class, it's an RN2 EC, we call it. We have also an RN4 EC, and the four is a four and a half inch suction cable. Okay. Um, the way you actually change the speed is right here in the electrical installation box, right here. There's a small little potentiometer, it's like the size of your thumbnail. You take a very small screwdriver and it's just it's like a dial, you just turn the dial, and it's from zero to ten. 10 being 100% speed, 5 would be 50% speed, so on and so forth. Really simple. Um, you can use that. You can actually even pull that little device out, and you can provide a 0 to 10 volt speed command signal from some other device if you have one. Um, and it's up to you to think of all the different devices that you might want to use to control the speed of a rate. So that explains it all here. That's what we got going on, and the neat part about it, like I said, is some energy savings and also um, dialing these things in. Um, so, two examples, real quick. Um, we look at a model RN2, right? An AC motor radar fan. That model right here, it's going to operate on its fan curve somewhere if we don't speak in front, and we shouldn't. It's going to be somewhere on this curve, okay? Which means, in, in this case, if this is the house and this line represents that system at that house, it's going to operate where that system line intersects that curve. And in this case, that's 1.6 inches of static suction, and it's moving 33 CFM of air. And the fan's consuming 43 watts in the process. Same house, if we use our model RN2 EC, um, if we left it at full speed, it would operate up here on the top of its duty range, but we can dial it down to right there where that was. And I'm not even saying that's all the house needs, I don't know, but I'm just showing that at that same point right there, the fan will only consume 35 watts, which you know, is less. You know, someone told me at my house I had to leave a light on all the time. It can be either 43 watts or 35. I said, well, I'll make it 35. Right? It's 19% savings, and over time that adds up to something. Um, so that's one example. Next one would be the, the larger model. So here we have an RN3. Let's say we have a uh, uh, mitigation system that would require operating here, or, or actually here, this required duty point, but because model RN3 is an AC motor, it's the closest band to that, that that actually doesn't go less than that. So it'll operate on the curve where that system line comes through and hits the curve up here. With this RN4 EC, we can dial that thing down from the top of the range down the system line to what we actually need. Okay? There. So, still moving the amount of air that we need at the, or the suction, the end one suction that we need, uh, which we decided was 2.1 inches at 45 CFM. Of course, this one's going to operate a little above that because we don't speak control. Now we're only consuming 64 watts, which is a 30% safety. So, that's one example of the whole thing. Good. On this. Yes. Questions or any of that before I move on?
that's by far the most complicated uh, as far headache as producing information. As far as the settings on the ECM, does it come and like take it out of 10 or like being oh, able to adjust it? Uh, well, <laughs> we would hope that at the factory all of those ship out of the factory at 10. Okay. But I don't prom I'm not going <laughs> to promise you that. Yeah. I mean, even if it was me on the line making these things, <laughs> I wouldn't even trust myself to make sure they're all on. So when you're supposed to, you check, you're obviously you're checking this. I've yet yeah. to have one that's not come at 10. Well, there you go. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> well, they, they've, they've all been wide open. They should, that, that's our intention, but I would check it every time. Yeah. Just to be sure. Yeah, I just was wondering how much uh, effect you can actually create as far as ramping it up versus trying to get a little more draw or something out of the house if you test and find you're not quite hitting them, you know, where you want to hit, so maybe ramp it up, but I guess if it's already banged up. I mean, it should already be on you, You'll know too right away, I mean, you fire that up, I mean, it's like, the wide open is pretty rowdy. <laughs> so, I, mean, I like that. Rowdy. Yeah. Yeah. Technical yeah. term. I mean, it is rowdy. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's like at full speed, it's somewhere near 4,000 RPM. I mean, okay. it is really spin. Really spin. <laughs> I mean, if it has to generate four and a half inches of suction in that size of pain. It's got uh, okay, now, a few other things that aren't fans. Uh, one is uh, some coupling. So we're a fan company, but these attach to our fans, so, you know. These actually, uh, the development of these actually came out of the RN4EC. Um, for a long time, Fantech's most powerful fan was what is similar to today's RN3. That was the old HP220, if any of if you are familiar with some of the old model numbers. Um, and we're always like, you know, we really need something that can go over four inches of suction. And so when our engineering team developed that, they are like, boy, this thing spins really fast, it's going to vibrate some, we need really good vibration isolation. Or if you don't, right, you don't want that vibration from the fan to ever transmit to the pipe and then on further to the structure. That just makes the whole system very objectionable from a noise perspective, right? So, our engineers were like, can we go with something that does a better job of isolating that vibration? I said, we'll take a look. And, and they came up with these. We call them LDVI. LDVI stands for Low Barometer Vibration Isolating. Um, and so I have one of these right here. Um, this is actually one of our um, uh, supply, uh, distributors, uh, PDS. This belongs to them, so I don't want to destroy it, but I'd be happy to pass it around. I mean, you can see it's very flexible. I mean, it's in intentionally. Um, and if, if you're used to a more of a standard plumbing uh, coupling, like Fernco is one of those brands, they make very nice couplings, and, and they're, they're good couplings, but they are actually very rigid. They were, they were designed with the intention of carrying liquid in pipes. And they also work for radon, but they're, they're very, they actually can transmit more vibration than we would like, especially when it's a really powerful thing. So these were kind of developed with that in mind, and we're like, well, gosh, these are actually really nice. And because they're so flexible, they're, they're easy to install. And if, if you've ever struggled with installing a, a, a fern coat, for instance, in really cold weather, you know, you can find these would be a lot easier. Um, we've done a couple of things. So since we designed these specifically for the radon application, we're like, now oh, we can do a couple of things. What else? Um, we put a little ledge or pipe stop, if you want to call it, in the coupling. Um, if you really want to, you can push the coupling pass that on the pipe if you really want to. Um, but it's there just as sort of a guide to set, mm, let's stop there. Um, it should give you enough uh, overlap to actually tighten that band to make a good connection on the, on the pipe. Um, but what you don't want, of course, is to push, the, it's so far that the, the fan itself and the pipe actually come in contact. Uh, and you kind of defeat the purpose. Um, so we do that. Uh, these things uh, come in the different sizes that the most common sizes that will connect our fans to either three or four inch pipe. Um, beyond that, if you start using six inch pipe or two inch pipe, we don't have we don't have those. Um, Burko probably does, but may not be this soft. Questions on that stuff? Yeah, are those going to be a similar price point to the Fern codes? Or? They, they tend to be a little more expensive. Okay. But clearly, way better. <laughs> uh, I did have somebody come up to us um, at this year's show, and I hadn't even thought about this. And they pointed out that when it gets really hot, so this guy's from Phoenix, and it's been known to get hot there occasionally. So, <laughs> he said that, 
and the way they install these. So in Phoenix, they have flat roofs on a lot of homes with no attics, and if they run the pipe up through the home, through the, the, the roof, then the fan is just, there's a short length of pipe above the top of the roof, and then a coupling, and then the fan, and then maybe like a guard on top of the fan to keep birds and squirrels out. But when it gets 160 degrees on the roof, this, this material gets even softer, and he says, you eh, might kind of, you know, so it may not be the best choice for that. And, and if you have a similar application, you know, just keep it in mind. We didn't, we, we never thought this would be for everything, but it is actually really good for a lot of stuff, so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Enough of that. It's just going. Uh, this thing we counted a couple of years ago, and we actually made a real big deal out of it at maybe the last in-person symposium, and maybe even one before that. But it's a tool. All it does is help you determine how much suction and or airflow, or the combination thereof, that you need to create the pressure field for active soil depressurization, um, whether it be a slab or whatever. And it's just a tool. So, but it does use our fan. It's that RN4EC fan, basically, with some added electronics there a manometer that we provide in the kit and a nice carrying case. And you use this to basically, you're determining that that amount of suction you need to pull to get that pressure field where you like, right? So most mitigators that I've talked to, they like to do a lot of test points when they do this. If they, if they go to this length, they put pressure uh, measuring points at all the farthest corners of the slab or, or, or maybe more than that. And they want to make sure that they can at least pull a differential, whatever they look comfortable with, at each of those far points. So if they're running a fan and they're creating some differential, a negative under the slab, say, at all those points, then pretty good chance they've got that negative throughout the entirety of that footprint of the slab. Meaning, if there is any leakage through the slab, it's going down, not up. And that's the idea. But this allows you to then decide how much do I need. I can actually, I know the exact amount that I need to deliver, and then I can use that to select the right fan, right? Can I get it done with an RN1? This will tell you. Can I do an RN2, 3, or I need a 4? Um, it's a nice tool. Anybody here have one? Who's waiting? You got one? You, you told me the other day, and you use it like on every job. Yeah, I, I love it. Work pretty well? It's got a web based map that you can plug in all the information and it will tell you exactly what you need to use. Mm -hmm. How much you would need and everything. So yeah. it's, it's don't, a don't even need to use the oil charts anymore. Yeah. <laughs> or your fingers don't. We do, it yeah, that comes right well, as soon as it still comes with these overlay charts and it actually makes it sound way more complicated than this, but it's actually really simple. Yeah. It's got a little dial on you can dial in and it tells you what suction it's running in. So lastly Six minutes. Yep. Radon alarm. Radon system alarm. We're not measuring radon. We are measuring a radon systems operation. A radon mitigation systems operation. So this is new for us. We never had one. So we've actually been in development on this for a while. Uh, and there's you know all the different suggestions. Boy, if it could do this and it could do this. All these different things, and if it reversible enough to be this and that and whatever, oh, it used to be the cheapest out of two people. Yeah. Well, <laughs> as good as we might be, we're not that good. So um, we had to pick and choose. So I'll go through a little bit, and it's not, we're not selling it yet. We hope to launch it maybe sometime after, uh, you know, the start of the year, 2022. Um, and, uh, you know, our right now sales managers here, and if you want to start placing orders now, I'm sure she'd take orders. <laughs> But you might not get a cool one. Um, I, have, uh, I have one here that's a prototype, and it was actually 3D printed, so this isn't a production model by any means. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to pass it around, but you're welcome to come and take a look at it. Um, the device is there. Actually, not a bad image. Um, it, um, like you said, we had some uh, development goals here. And uh, you know, we also saw that the industry was going to start requiring these more. So there's a lot of good radon system alarms out there already. We're like, they don't maybe need another one, but we did have a lot of customers saying, "Wish you had an alarm." Okay, if we did, what would you like it to be able to do those sort of things? So 
this is kind of where they all came. And then we see the market for that expanding with more regulation and, and the standards requiring it. Okay. Um, it's, this thing is, the, the goals were to make this super simple. Now, it, it must be installed on the actual system pipe, upstream of the fan, right? Before the fan. Has to go somewhere there on the pipe, can't go on the wall. Um, but all you do is drill a hole, small hole, in the pipe, peel this off, pop it in, runs on batteries, two double A's, we provide the first set. Or I guess that's the intention, get the first two from us. <laughs> Um, I think Ivan told me he expects a few years before the batteries run out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we other don't than, need to buy the batteries. Yeah. Um, other than that, um, as far as that's the installation and the setup is just about as simple. There's a um, there's a, a couple of bit switches on the back, too small to see. That's a better image. Um, there's actually two dip switches. The one that's on the top, you choose 24 hours or, or 96 hours, so one day or four days. And that's the duration that the pressure has to be off for it to actually start to alert. And when I say the pressure's off, I'll get to that. The bottom dip switch, you can actually turn the audible portion of this off. Um, but it's tucked away on the back here so that once it's installed, the homeowner's not doing that. Now, if they pull it off, they could. Um, but uh, either leave it on, in the audible, because it has an audible and a visual indication, the, vis the visible on the front, and that can't be turned off. It, it's got an LED and it's going to blink. Um, but then there's also a, on the front here, you take the cover off where the batteries are, there's a test or learn button. And basically, once your system's installed, set up and running, and stable, put this in, hit the test button, now it learns what that differential suction pressure that system's operating at. And then it gives itself basically a range. It gives itself a little variance in that pressure for weather changes, time of year, stuff like that. Because it won't always be exactly that. But if you fall out of that range for either the 24 hours or 96 hours that you selected, it will start to alarm. Then there's lastly a snooze button up here so that the homeowner doesn't have to listen to that alarm until you get yourself over there to help them. Um, they can get snooze and they'll quiet the alarm for seven days. And then it'll start alarming you. Um, I asked our product manager some questions um, about that. Um, this thing actually, if the system gets corrected, it should self um, reset um, in the process. So if something weird was happening and then, who knows, loss of power to the house or something, and then that power is restored. This system, this this thing should, the intention is that it should just turn off its alarm state. And once the fans creates that suction again, uh, that's looking for. Um, and then he gave me a list. This is gonna be hard to see. Um, I think I mentioned most of this. There's some stuff in here you probably don't care about. The dimensions, weight. Uh, it's got, yep, the seven day snooze. Some different things. Yeah. Um, one thing here, the red says we can't mount on the wall. But there's some there's some competitors' products out there that, that can. Ours just ours has to be the yes. Was there any discussion around putting that 24 and 96 hour switch on the side of that unit? So let's say that we set up one way and the client's like, well, I, I don't want the other one. We, you know, like, we did discuss that. Okay, yeah. We did discuss that and uh, what we heard from the majority yeah. of litigators yeah. was they wanted <laughs> to have control of that and yeah. not have yeah. the homeowner have yeah. it. Yeah, have them turn it off and then not yes. know. So that's why it's on the it. back versus the front. Right. Exactly. And it will work better for service programs and whatever yeah. you would have. So that's why we Yeah, they got the students if they want it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I will answer questions as long as one else comes in here, but there's a good chance the next person, and that person may already be here. Is that you? No. <laughs> no, I had a question. Yeah, sure. So, for my exterior installation, this is just fine. It's wonderful. It's a great system. Good question. No, I'm told this this must not be installed outside. It must be indoors. Not weatherproof. So it won't work for that. If you don't have a portion of the pipe inside, so you tell me to go down the street to the your competitor. There's there's ways around that. I, I, maybe not around that one, but there are way there are ways around that. Well, well, and this is first phase, Michael. So here's the thing: is we're 
we were asked to get a product out there, and that's where no, this is where that's we started. That's fine. I mean, it, it, like I said, it, it, it's not everything that everybody would love to be, and at that price, so we <laughs> had to make some decisions. So what's the price? It, how much you want? Thirty-five dollars. Maybe. I don't. I don't. I don't even know that. We, we're competitive in the marketplace. That's what it say. should be. It should be competitive with, with other technology ones. But it, it does need to be inside. Is what our product. No, is. I. If, if you want something outside, get a magnet. Yeah. All right. That's all I'm going to you. That's all I need. Thank you, everyone. And then come by our booth and uh, get some candy. And, and if you have more questions, we're there and today. And is there our raffle for a five hundred dollar cash prize? We're looking at that. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, where are you from? From New Mexico. Yeah. 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 He's probably get a double game box right. on the bike, and that'll probably fit for him. So how long is your little thing oh. thing? That's why I, I have no idea. Yeah. 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 So yeah. That yeah. Yeah. yeah, but but, but you can still hold it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.